Learning to code is something that anyone can do. It doesn't require any kind of special intelligence or talent. And I can say that with absolute confidence because I code for a living myself. <laughs> um, I've also helped to teach lots of kids coding over the years through the amazing network called Coder Dojo. Um, thank you. Um, it's a lot of fun. Um, however, uh, learning to code is much like learning any other skill, in my opinion, whether that's learning to play the guitar, or whether it's learning to knit, or whether it's learning to build things in Minecraft. You start with one block, learning a small skill, which you then put one on top of another over time until you've arrived at something quite spectacular and really advanced. Over the years I've been teaching kids coding, I've never found a common thread on which to hang the uh, coder type. Sometimes it's the nerdy kids that take to coding, and sometimes not. Sometimes it's the kids who have just been dropped off from football practice and they're still bouncing off the walls when they get there that take into coding, and sometimes not. Sometimes coding is the magic key which unlocks the, other, the talents of an otherwise withdrawn kid who doesn't have great grades and doesn't really know what to do with his life. This certainly was the, what coding did for me, anyway. So, if there is no coding type, it is my belief that really anyone can code and that everybody should be given the chance to try. So, what things do you need in place in order to be able to learn to code? Well, it turns out it's a pretty simple list. You need some time, you need no distractions, you need some dedication, space, some education materials, and some technology. That's it. So where might be a good place to do this kind of thing? Well, good answers to this question include things like uh, schools, universities, or code clubs like Coda Dojo. But I'd like you to think of a new space, one which is very much misrepresented, forgotten about, and pushed into a corner, but a space where teaching people coding can have a profound effect on their lives and their future prospects. So this is HMP Humber in the north of England. Now HMP in this context does not stand for the Snapchat slang, help me please. <laughs> this is HMP Humber, which stands for Her Majesty's Prison. I want to argue that teaching prisoners coding is a really good idea and something every country should be trying to do. So, some stats first about prisons. In the UK, some 86,000 people currently reside in one of these institutions. That's the highest in Western Europe. We also know that within 12 months of release, 50% of those released will end up back in prison. And that's just kind of a terrifying statistic and comes at huge cost to society. We also know that one of the most effective ways of reducing reoffending is to get people into work when they come out. Yet at the same time, the work and education offered in prisons remains mundane, repetitive, and is not linked to the external job market. We also know in the UK, much like every other country, that we have a huge shortfall of coding talent. We want to try and solve both those problems. So, it turns out prisons are actually a really good place to teach coding, and prisoners make excellent students. This is why. Remember the six things we talked about that you need in place <laughs> to do this. You need, uh, the, the guys have so much time, they don't know what to do with, they're literally doing time. <laughs> they, have, they have no distractions. You're not gonna find people doing social media, or being on their mobile phones in a workshop in a prison because there's no internet. And given the chance, most people will dedicate themselves to something 100% of the time because prisons are so boring. And this is part of the problem with prisons, what causes the root cause of many of the problems in them. So it's been the project of the last two to three years of my life to put in place the three remaining building blocks you need in order to code inside a prison. And that's by providing a space, 
by providing the education materials and by providing the technology they need to get going. Now, it's normally at this point in the talk I get some skepticism. People say to me, well, can prisoners really learn to code? But which I take them to mean, are prisoners clever enough to learn coding? Well, the simple answer to that question is yes, they are. This is Dwayne Jackson. Now, Dwayne grew up in a series of care homes in the UK, and in one of those care homes, he found an old ZX Spectrum, which he blew the dust off and started to teach himself the basic programming language. However, growing up in a succession of care homes is not a great start in life, and for Dwayne, it was more a question of when, as opposed to if, he would get in trouble with the law. And for Duane, this happened in 1999 in Atlanta airport when he was caught with a duffel bag full of ecstasy pills. So after, after doing time in US prisons and then back in the UK, he was finally released. When on release, he started up as an IT consultant and then started building some online accounting software called Cashflow, which he was then able to sell for an eight-figure sum. This is not bad for an ex-offender with very few qualifications. And I'm very happy to say that Dwayne is now helping us to recruit prisoners and ex-offenders into the coding project. But it turns out that coding has several other uh, great possibilities for prisoners. First of all, coding has an extremely low barrier to entry. So many jobs that might be interested in saying which university you went to, who you know, what grades you got, people who are hiring coders are typically interested in one thing, can you code? <laughs> Secondly, the, the coding community is fantastic. It's a global network where you can work on some of the best platforms, have the best tools, some of the best forums, all for free or for next to nothing. And I can think of no other profession in the world where you get quite so much help from your fellow coders as in coding. And they're literally falling over each other to help you out on your coding problems. The third thing is that it has extremely low startup costs. So today, armed with a $200 laptop and an internet connection, you can basically play in the same ballpark as the big players like Facebook and Google, and your startup costs are less than that of a window cleaner. So it seems like coding is a great idea, but where did this concept come from? Well, about three years ago, an email dropped into my inbox and it was about this project. It's called The Last Mile, which is, runs out of San Quentin Prison in California. It's been teaching prisoners coding for a few years, and they've seen some phenomenal success. They've gone from a 70% recidivism rate to zero. Nobody who's been on this program has gone on to reoffend. That's fantastic. So I was immediately hooked and thought, this is a brilliant idea. I wonder if I can volunteer for a similar project in the UK or maybe in Sweden. But after some initial research, it became immediately apparent that there were no other projects around. There was one project in San Quentin, and then there was another project in South Africa called Brothers for All. So I faced a bit of a dilemma, and I was thinking, well, either I give up or I try and start a project on my own. The problem was, I knew absolutely nothing about prisons. I'd never been to a prison. I didn't know anybody who'd been in prison. And uh, to be honest, prisons are pretty scary. Um, so I, I sort of put it on a back burner for a while and thought, I'll just leave that. It's a great idea, but maybe it's not for me. But then it was like somebody was trying to prod me, because a couple of weeks later, another email popped into my inbox. This time, it was from the Guardian newspaper, and it was about the then Prime Minister launching a huge prison reform project in the UK. Something like this hadn't happened for 20, 30 years. They wanted to talk about new education possibilities in prison and getting people into jobs. And I thought, this is too good an opportunity to miss. So through a friend of a friend of a friend, I managed to reach out to the then Director of Strategy at the Ministry of Justice in London. Now, it turns out she too was also thinking about how to get coding into prisons, but she didn't really know how to get started. So we put our heads together and got a workshop set up in London, invited over the great and the good, and also brought over the last mile to help us get going. Now, in the workshop, things were going well, but then I was faced with this now familiar question that I get all the time about this project. People there said, well, 
given prisoners lower than average education levels, will they be able to learn coding? Well, this time, to answer that question, I had a secret weapon. This is Kenyatta Lial. Kenyatta, when I first met him in London, described his formative years for him and his friends as a conveyor belt from the projects into the prison complex. And this happened to Kenyatta twice. On the second time, he was arrested and sent to San Quentin for armed robbery and possession of a deadly weapon. However, in San Quentin, he started the difficult process of turning his life completely around. And after studying a couple of degrees in prison, he then enrolled for the Last Mile program. And then on release, he's now one of the hardest working people you will ever meet, ex-offender or not. And it was the eloquence of his story and his personal story about turnaround in Last Mile that won us the argument in that small cramped room in London. So fast forward about 12 months through some of the worst bureaucracy I've ever encountered. <laughs> it was like wading through treacle. Uh, but we've now got our first pilot set up at HMP Humber in the north of England with lots of other prisons lined up behind it to give this a go. The project is called Code 4000, which is named after the 4,000 days it took Dwayne Jackson from his first incarceration to selling his first company. So, thank you. So even though we've only been going about 12 months, we've already got our first graduates coming through the door. This is Ash. Now, before Code 4000, Ash was in and out of jail constantly for violent behavior. Antisocial, not a great guy to be around. However, since Code 4000, he's completely turned his life around and he's found something in coding that he really enjoys and has become really good at. So since release, he's now got a job as a JavaScript developer in London and is living a proper, normal life. It's a fantastic turnaround and a great story and huge credit to Ash and his determination to do something better with his life. So at Code 4000, we do this for three simple reasons. The first reason is it's huge fun. It's great fun to see people's lives turn around 180 degrees like that. Secondly, we do it because it works. People who go through this project and then go into jobs are able to return to normal society and contribute society in a positive way. Thirdly, because it unlocks the talents of some of the most marginalized people in society. And if we can't just keep putting them in the cycle of going in and out of prison, we have to do something about that. But learning, teaching coding in prison is a really difficult thing to do. For a start, there's no internet. So the typical things a coder might use to help them join the day, things like Stack Overflow or Google, simply aren't available. So this means we have to download a huge offline curriculum for use in the workshop. However, this is where the fun part of being part of a global coding community kicks in again. So an idea that first started in the States and in South Africa has now migrated to the UK. And with our help, we're trying to set up some similar projects in France and Australia. And we've just learned about an amazing project in Kenya, which is teaching coding to female prisoners with huge success. So this means at this moment in time, there are more projects teaching prisoners coding in prisons in Africa than there are in Europe. That's fantastic. We want to color this map, basically. So the idea is simple. It's to bring one of the 21st century's most vibrant skills to one of the most marginalized groups in society. And we do that because we simply believe anyone can code and everyone should have the right to try. Thank you. Thank you.